Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so happy that you decided to spend your evening hours with us here um, virtually. Um, I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock, and I work at the Institute for Science and Policy, a project of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And together with our partners at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado, we are really excited to be bringing you tonight's episode that we've called Do No Harm, Why We Trust or Mistrust Medical Science. So I don't know about you all, but to me, medicine is very fundamental to being human. It is all about our own personal health as well as those of our loved ones and family members. Um, and because it is very personal and human, it is what I think as being really the intersection of where science and society interact. And then because of that, it means it's very complicated. It has a very complicated history um, that has made it ever more complicated as we have an ever evolved understanding about our knowledge about medicine and medical science. And because we're only human, it also means it brings with it a whole suite of challenges as we think about the ethics, the morality, our biases as we go about making decisions regarding our health. Uh, tonight's series is going to tackle some of these challenges. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers. Um, before, before I introduce them, I do want to give a special recognition and thanks to a friend of the Institute, Dr. Mark Levine. Um, he's the one who really instigated uh, the, tonight's episode. It is foundational to what we've been talking about at the Institute about trust in science and has been made ever more present with the COVID-19 pandemic and how we've been managing that. So a huge thank you for dark, Dr. Mark Levine for kind of kicking us off in this direction. So a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, I think we're all getting pretty familiar with Zoom. So if you're tuned in on Zoom, we're excited to see you here. Um, go ahead and open that chat feature. Um, Nicole's been asking you to tell us where you're watching from and who you're watching with. So go ahead and feel free to type that in if you haven't already. And that's gonna be where you ask us your questions. Tonight's episode is all about dialogue. And so we wanna hear your questions. So feel free to type them in throughout tonight's episode, including right now. Um, we also did ask you to type in your questions in advance when we asked you to register. So we've already gotten those and have thought through some of those as well. Um, we're also broadcasting to Facebook. So hello to our Facebook audience over there. Um, you can use that comment feature the same way you would our chat feature over here on Zoom. We've got eyes on both. Okay, so now let's get on to the show. I am going to introduce our three wonderful speakers and our host for the evening um, and turn this over to them. It is with great pleasure that we are working and partnering with Dr. Matt Winia. I met Matt when he joined us for one of our COVID-19 Monday morning episodes where he talked about ethics. And to be honest, I could have spent the next five hours talking with him. And so I'm really excited that he's joining us tonight as our host and our moderator. Dr. Matt Winia is the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz. His career has included developing a research institute, training programs, focusing on bioethics, professionalism, and policy issues. He has leadership extensive beyond I can imagine if in his bio. I encourage you all to Google all of our folks because I'm not going to do him justice tonight. Um, and he's going to be hosting a panel of three really prominent speakers and guests. Uh, our first one is Dr. Le Representative Leslie Herod. She was elected in 2016 as the first LGBTQ African American to our state general assembly. She currently serves as the chair of the House Finance Committee. Vice Chair of the House Judiciary Committee and Chair of our Committee on Legal Services. Representative Harris also chairs the Colorado Black Democratic Legislative Caucus and the Arts Caucus. So far, she's already sent 68 bills to the governor's desk since her time in the General Assembly, marshalling through numerous pieces of legislation to address criminal justice reform, mental health and substance abuse, renewable energy, youth homelessness, and civil rights protections. We also have Dr. Stephanie Johnson joining us tonight. Dr. Johnson, an associate professor at the University of Colorado Leeds School of Business. She holds the Andrea and Michael Leeds Research Fellowship, is a director for the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative, and is a 2020 Rio Fellow. And it could be RIO, but I'm going to say Rio. She studies the intersections of leadership and diversity, focusing on how unconscious bias affects the evaluation of leaders and strategies that leaders can use to mitigate bias. She has a new book out called Inclusify, which is about harnessing the power of uniqueness and belonging to innovative teams and ways to build more inclusive teams. Um, and if you do join us this evening or if you've typed in a question, we're going to throw all of your names in a hat. And when we're done after time this episode, we're going to send 
one of you a lucky copy of signed book from Stephanie Johnson. Um, and last but definitely not least um, is our dear leader here at the museum, George Sparks. George has been president and CEO of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science since 2004. Prior to coming to the museum, George worked at Hewlett Packer and Allegiant Technologies, and he also served his nine years in the Air Force as a pilot and an assistant professor of aeronautics at the Academy. George's passion, as I can clearly attest to, is public policy, particularly around science and education. He is a member of numerous boards and other volunteer things, including serving on the Colorado Forum, the Colorado Education Initiative, Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, and so many more. I'm not going to do him justice. So that is tonight's excellent lineup. Let me turn this over to our host, Dr. Matt Lania. Good morning, or I should say good evening, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> We're used to speaking in the morning. Yes. Thank you so much for uh, that lovely introduction. And I'm so pleased to be um, partnering with the Denver Museum and the Institute on this project, this uh, conversation tonight. Um, I want to jump right in and ask each of the folks joining us tonight, it, it, and I'm going to use a science metaphor here, tell me the lens that you bring to this conversation. How do you view the issues around trust or mistrust in medical science. And then the second part of this um, opener question is, um, if there is one thing you want to make sure we get to talk about tonight, what is it? Because I do want to make sure that if there are a few messages that we get those out early and often. And I'll, I'll give you my own answer to this question quickly because um, Kristen already mentioned Mark Levine. Um, I think we, we ought to also acknowledge that there is a group of, um, of people at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities who are friends of our center and who get together um, on a regular basis to reflect on and commemorate the tragic events of the Holocaust and the role of medicine and the theory of eugenics, which at the time was a scientific theory. And this was, um, this was actually where the idea for this trust and mistrust in science came up, was in the context of saying, look, some people mistrust science, but look at the history. There are reasons sometimes why people mistrust science. And how do we get an appropriate balance of skepticism and trust in the scientific enterprise? So I wanna bring that as my lens um, to the conversation tonight. Um, George, do you mind kicking us off? What's the lens that you bring to this? And, and is there one or two, you know, are there one or two things you wanna really make sure we touch on? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, people that know me know that my passion is really climate change and climate science. So for the last 10 years, I've been studying this extensively. And it turns out the science around climate is extraordinarily complicated. People spend their entire career trying to understand this. And then they discover they have to influence people to act on a worldwide basis to create policy to affect climate. So it's a, it's a, double, a double whammy there as far as difficulty. So along comes COVID. And for a while, I was elated in that we all seemed to be working together. Dr. Fauci became the most respected man in America. Everybody accepted the science. But then slowly, as things started to uh, devolve, the science came under more of an attack. Um, it, there were a lot of communications issues I'll talk about later. And then the people part of this and the policy part uh, also became much more difficult. So the thing that I want you to remember tonight is that science is a journey. It is never over. Science is not immutable. You are always looking for the real answer. And as Matt said today, the more he learns about his, his uh, field, uh, the more he realizes he doesn't know. Science is the best that we have today. It involves models and theories and trials and then repeating the process over and over again. And turns out those are not the best characteristics for influencing people and influencing public policy. They want certainty, uh, especially when it's an existential threat like COVID. So it turns out that we started the Institute for Science and Policy, helping people understand what is science, that it's the best we have at the time, and how can we use science to influence and create better public policy? Good, sorry. Stephanie, do you mind going next um, and tell us what the lens is that you bring to this conversation tonight? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, my PhD and my background is in psychology. And so the lens that I view this through is how we make decisions and how biases and emotions impact what we feel are really logical um, decisions. And I guess the thing I would want people to take away today is that although we are generally bad at uh, making decisions and letting emotions impact the way we think and act, it's even harder to do um, to make good decisions when you're under this extreme stress that we're all experiencing together from COVID. And so I think it becomes even more important to really scrutinize the way we're viewing the world and try to make the best decisions possible based on science. I'm sure you said something lovely, Matt, but um, it was, you're on mute. Sorry, it's not allowing me to unmute. Uh, Representative Herod, I was, <laughs> what, the lovely thing I was saying um, is that I can imagine you've got a few lenses that you could bring to this. So um, what, how do you think about this issue of trust in science? And, and is there something you'd like to really make sure we get to cover tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, I just want to say thank you, George, for making my childhood make sense. Um, I remember uh, growing up, I was very into science. And then uh, Bill Nye, you might know him as a science guy, lied to me. And all of a sudden, science had changed. And I was like, what? I thought this was fact. Everything is black and white. This is very clear. But it's a lie, right? So I got so mad. And I literally threw away my chemistry set and said, I'm moving on and started reading a lot and got into history and soft sciences. Can you believe that? Literally, it's the truth. And my brother apparently somehow made it through the lie and said that science was evolving, which I didn't really get that in the third grade. I didn't, I just thought it, a lie is a lie um, or they're wrong. And he actually is an anesthesiologist now. Um, so he took it the other way, the way I think you're kind of supposed to take it, um, that it is evolving and that there's so much more to learn and it's so vast, right? But that there is um, a place for exploration in the sciences, which um, I have grown to now appreciate and love so much more. But the lens that I bring is, you know, I'm the first uh, African American queer person to hold office in Colorado. So my life is intersectional, you know? Um, and for me, it's really about when we're in these this COVID time, one, how do we keep society safe as an elected official, right? I mean, that is my job. Uh, two, um, how do we ensure that we break down these health disparities that are very real uh, within uh, science period, but health disparities um, specifically in the medical science, you know, in COVID, but also outside of COVID. What are we gonna do to address this? And acknowledge that there are disparities, but also that there are differences, right? Uh, and that those two things can exist at the same time. So for me, it's really about, um, you know, that's the lens I, I come to this with is somewhat of a skepticism a little bit, to be honest with you, but then also a, a realization that we have to work with science. Um, we, as elected official, we need science. We need scientists, we need science, we need the data, um, and we also need to be nimble enough to change when we need to. And then as a black person, it's just so important for me that we get more black people into the sciences, which is why my brother got in. Um, and into the health sciences specifically, but across the board, um, because we are impacted too. And when we're not at the table, there's disproportionate, harmful, and sometimes deadly consequences. So those are the lenses that I bring. And it's always fun for me to be a part of these conversations because I'm definitely an outsider looking in. So I always learn so much, um, but we need more policymakers who actually have science, uh, science background, or even just scientists advising us. It's so important. You know, um, we've, between the three or four of us, we've already touched on a few of the root causes of mistrust in science. And I'm wondering if, um, you know, George, would you summarize for us what you think might be, so we've talked a little bit about the fact that science changes. Um, and that's the way it's designed, right? That it's a skeptical endeavor. The whole of science is about proving ideas wrong more than it is about proving ideas right. Uh, and, and that's 
counterintuitive to many folks who, who assume that what people are trying to do in science is prove that something is right. Yeah. But in fact, we're trying to prove we're, we're trying to prove each other wrong all the time. That's how that's how people make their careers in science is by disproving someone else. Um, so there's that. Are there other major factors that we you know historical, contemporary that we really ought to be bearing in mind as we start this conversation? And I'm starting with this in the sort of you know seek first to understand and then to be understood mindset, right? Like we should understand how might someone come to a point where they really mistrust the scientific enterprise? Yeah, as I, as I said before, uh, you'd have been studying climate. Climate is something that happens over decades and decades, and many of us won't even live to see what the answer is. It takes so long. But COVID has been really unique in that it's, in, it's a real-time existential threat. And we had an opportunity here to, to really uh, give people confidence in the science. And I think we made a few mistakes as we've gone through this. And frankly, uh, I think we should have expected that. The first one was around masks. Uh, originally with ours, masks don't help. And it turns out they told us that because they didn't want to have a run on PPE for medical folks, but they didn't really highlight that part. And then they came back and said, masks are good. And finally, we're I think every, most people accept that masks are good, that we don't like to wear them necessarily, but we, we do believe that, that they do a good job. And then there was this comment about uh, asymptomatic carriers, people that were asymptomatic. We didn't even know what that even meant. So originally we thought they couldn't spread the disease. And then the World Health Organization came out and said, oh yes, they can. And then about 12 hours later, they came back and said, well, we don't really know for sure. And as it turns out, they, uh, they recently published that says, yes, they in fact can spread the disease. So this uncertainty and the back and forth on this, as we learn more literally by the day, really does, uh, has caused people some concern. And the final one was around wearing masks uh, in large crowds. And when the protests were happening around the uh, murder of George Floyd, uh, you didn't hear a lot about, uh, about uh, the protesters not wearing masks. But as soon as the president had a rally down in Tulsa, uh, that was the main co topic of conversation was uh, it was a dangerous endeavor because people weren't wearing masks. So th it, at that point, it became a political issue, not just a scientific issue. So I think the way we communicated it was at best inartful. Stephanie, do you want to jump in here? Because you and I had an earlier conversation about some of the um, sort of psychological tricks that your mind can play, especially when you're in a circumstance of uh, stress or fear. Um, does that does that come into play in terms of people's ability or willingness or you know capacity to absorb new information and and change behavior as a result? Absolutely, and I like the tie that George made to Representative Harrod's story of Bill Nye. I think that some of what we're seeing is people feel like, well, if you lied to me then, how do I know you're not lying to me now? You told me not to wear a mask, and now you are telling me to wear a mask. What am I? Which one should I believe? Uh, so I think there's some of that going on and the politicized nature of this conversation. Uh, but it's also just our emotions affect our behavior. We're stressed out and scared. And then there's this real desire. This is my psychology background, but um, for people to be consistent. And I know I feel this way mm -hmm. that I'm like, okay, I, I am going to totally lock down. I won't leave my house. I won't go to the grocery store. I'm going to do all of these things. To be, I want to be extremely safe. And then I'm a CU professor and the students are coming back. So I'm like, well, if I'm going to go to campus and teach students, then maybe I can also go to the grocery store and maybe it's not so bad to do, you know, to go on a driving vacation or whatever it might be. And I feel like I see that a lot too, where people swing from, I'm going to be, you know, the extreme safest, but if it's safe for our kids to go back to school, isn't it safe for me to, you know, do what, go to the mall or whatever people might do or like if my job requires me to come into the office it must be safe enough for me to do these other things and so I feel like there's some of that it's hard to for us to really understand the relative risks of different activities and so we kind of say you know do or don't and I think that's a lot easier for people to get their head around. Representative Herod uh, um, I wonder if you could comment on um, you know, there's a, a fair number of studies suggesting that certain minority communities, and in particular the black community, um, have 
historical as well as contemporary reasons for having some level of mistrust in medical science and in particular, um, you know, experimental science. Um, and and I, I wonder if you would say a word about that and whether you think that is playing out in any way during the COVID pandemic um, or, or not, right? Is, is this just, um, you know, so, such a large um, thing that it's overrun that history? Oh, it is uh, most certainly playing out. And I'm, I'm glad you asked that question uh, because we have to address it. You know, um, our interventions when we're trying to deal with the disparities that exist around COVID have to be culturally competent for many reasons. One, they won't work. But we have to acknowledge the fact that Black folks have had a very complicated history with science. Oh, sorry, that's my new puppy. Um, <laughs> his name is Clinton. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of which, I should have started by saying thank you for being with us instead of being at the DNC tonight. Yeah, yeah. I'm having my fellow Clintons tonight, so we're okay. But um, so, <laughs> anyways, um, but it, it's it's really it's very real, right? So our bodies have been used as test tubes and um, and and violated and you know in so many ways um, since we came over in the slave ships. Right. Um, and then it's like we've been tested on, tested on, tested on. And then all of a sudden, no tests were done on us. And we don't know if medication has the same effects on us. And then we hear that certain medications have a worse effect on us because we haven't brought it's like you, it was it was so race based. Right. And it was harmful for black folks. And then all of a sudden it became well, we need to be colorblind as scientists. And that is completely inaccurate. Right. And then now we're in this place where we've actually started to break down some of the colorblind policies and say, no, we have to have a, a racial equity lens on even you know, health and science because otherwise we're not gonna be effective. And so when we're talking about COVID, um, I've had very tough conversations with people in my community who say, what's the point in following any of this in the first place? If I wear a mask, I could get shot, right? No one's talking about that. Um, because of the way that black folks are perceived in society. Um, you know, they go to the doctor, but our pain is not seen as real or as valid as a white person's pain. And we see black people um, at much larger numbers dying at home from COVID because they weren't admitted to the hospital in the first place. Now, CU is doing some really interesting things in tracking people and ensuring um, that if they're sent home, that there's actually some type of aftercare and we can monitor to make sure that we are, you know, filtering out for disparities and bringing people in when they're feeling pain. But these things are all very real. And what I really appreciated in this moment is that um, medical institutions and scientists, and scientists are, are looking at this and saying we have to have a racial equity lens on this stuff now. We have to. That wasn't happening even two years ago, I think, in a real way, like it is now. So I'm really appreciative of that, but it is very real. And just the, the, the interventions in our communities look different. I mean, we're not even, the first person we call looks different when we're um, unwell, you know? Um, and so it is very important that we have that lens um, and that we acknowledge it directly and that we bring diverse uh, voices to the table when we're designing interventions. Can I follow up on that with, um, this may be a little bit of a controversial question, but I'm curious because uh, it makes very good sense to me that you might tailor a message to a given audience um, with respect to you know, the, the, the view, the, the history, um, the experiences that they bring to the issue. And yet one of the standard sort of teachings in terms of uh, public communication and risk communication is that your message should be consistent and the same all the time. And I'm wondering if you ever have to balance that, you know, in your in your political work, um, the extent to which you tailor a message to a given audience and the balancing act of making sure that your message is consistent and follows, you know, the same track all the time. Is that is that ever a, an issue? Absolutely. It is an issue. And I think some people do it well and some people don't. The core thing is to be authentic in everything that you do, you know, no matter what. And even if even if your your message um, comes out differently, uh, the core of it has to be the same. You know, at, at the core of wearing masks, even though I'm having a very different conversation with the black community about it, at the core 
of that is science and is, you know, helping to contain the spread and to take care of our friends, families, and neighbors, period, right? Take care of each other. And so that core value is very much the same, but how the message is delivered, it just looks a little bit different, you know? Um, and, and that's just real. That's meeting people where they are. Again, something that we, we try to do in politics, sometimes not well, some, and something that I think people try to do in science, sometimes not well. We've got to meet folks where they are. And if that means it comes across a little differently in your initial approach, it doesn't mean that the core value and the core message has to change. Um, Stephanie, can you also weigh in on this? Because I know we wanted to talk a little bit about risk communication and strategies for talking about things that are evolving and uncertain. And are there, are there best practices around this that you could, that you could articulate in terms of uh, public communication or for that matter, communication with friends, neighbors, Facebook friends, um, you know, if you really want to, if you really want to dig into it, t tell us if there's a trick for talking to someone who seems to have moved from mere, uh, you know, appropriate skepticism all the way into sort of science denial, where no matter where it feels like no matter what you bring to the table, they're not going to be able to see it because of the worldview that they've sort of adopted. Yeah, there's so much here. I mean, first, I want to echo um, some of what Representative Harrod said in that I think it's super important that we have diverse voices communicating this message because if you think about trust, how can you trust a group of people who don't look anything like you and there's a historical legacy of them not having your best interest um, at heart and in, in everything that we do. Um, so I think that's something that maybe we're not doing a great job of um, in this in this specific situation and many others. Uh, but there's also just, it's so hard for science people to communicate um, things like, well, we, you know, we have a 95% confidence in um, the reliability of this test and what that really means to people. And so I think because we don't always translate that really well, people look to other sources of data. So maybe it's anecdotes and I heard this phrase once that the plural of anecdote is not data. So if three people told you that they went in the pool and didn't get COVID, that doesn't mean that it's safe to go in the pool. But that's easier for people to get their head around than, you know, one study showed this and one study showed something else. And we may not know the quality of those studies or where they're published or, you know, what it means to go through peer review. Um, so I think it all becomes super complicated and some of this is like understanding what sources we should look to for um, science and should we be looking for consensus in um, reports and how do we make sense of just like so much information um, that comes out and you know some of the onus is upon the scientists to communicate this and some of it is of course on policymakers and the media who's often um, really looking for what's the most interesting headline um, rather than what's the best representation of the science. That's interesting. You know, media is supposed to be the intermediary, right? They're, they're supposed to bring this complex information in a way that is understandable. Um, one of the things that we mentioned earlier, and I want to come back to George as we, as we turn back to you, is um, the notion of confirmation bias and people sort of seeking out information that will reconfirm beliefs that they already have and tending to discount information that disconfirms their prior belief. And all of us are prone to this. It's a human thing that we seek to confirm the things that we believe. Um, how do you think about that as a science communicator, as an educator, um, how do you think about bringing someone new information that they may not want to hear um, and, and help people essentially through a process of learning something that they maybe, you know, didn't want to learn to begin with. It, are there tricks of the trade for your museum or your work as a, as a public communicator about science in helping, you know, helping people get past the confirmation bias problem? 
Uh, yeah, we prefer you not call it tricks of the trade. We prefer to call <laughs> it a fact, but, but I understand what you're asking there. Uh, by the way, I like, would like to comment quickly, though, on uh, the fact that today Moderna, the, the people making the vaccine, found out that they're behind because they haven't been able to enroll enough African-Americans and Latinos in the study. And what that means is the study is going to be delayed for everybody because of a lot of reasons, but I would suspect part of it is that the, those communities don't trust the scientists that are doing, doing this study. So it, it hurts everyone. It just doesn't hurt the communities directly involved. So uh, talking about how do you influence somebody, I, I think I have this saying that life is about relationships. And it turns out it, it, you can always get down to the relationships. Everything I talked about, about the science being complicated, but it always comes down to the people and trust, you trust people and you trust institutions. You don't necessarily, you, you sure as heck don't trust data. You, nobody is convinced because of data. Uh, as scientists, we like to go, if you just knew what I knew, the policy is self-evident. And that is absolutely not the case. Uh, we, we, we tend to just uh, pepper people with data, data and more data, and it has absolutely no effect on people. If you want to have effect on people and to uh, under, have them uh, change their mind about something, you have to develop a relationship with them and gently guide them through a process of understanding, all of it based on trust. Now, I would ask everybody on this call, I want you to pick up a pen right now, and I want you to write down the last time you changed your mind on anything substantial. And we could probably sit here for the next hour, and half of us will not come up with a single thing that we can remember that we changed our mind around. Now, my, I could come up with one, and that was around plastic bags at King Supers. Uh, I, could, I could quote you how much volume the plastic bags were gonna consume, et cetera, but my staff and my family gently took me over the last several years to now, I'm okay if we don't get a plastic bag at King Supers. And that's, that was a long, long journey for me on something that's relatively trivial in my life. Can you imagine what it's like to try to convince somebody of something around medical science where it's gonna affect them directly? And that's such a funny example, George, because now plastic bags are back. <laughs> and you, just when you decided to bring your own bags, then they are right. always behind. If I'll, I want to chime in here a little bit too, and just um, I agree, like fully agree that the numbers don't matter. Like I can't even remember the numbers, right? And so I feel like there's a real value in pairing numbers with stories that really support the data. I think that uh, because when our views are formed based on emotions, what science, if you trust it, shows is that the best way to change those views is through emotion. And I think that's what you're saying is trust and relationships. Um, otherwise, to the point of confirmation bias, I mean, just think about where you go for news. Are you looking at whatever, you know, if I'm super liberal, am I looking at Fox News? which is a more conservative news outlet. If I'm super conservative, do I spend all my time watching CNN? Probably not, right? So we, and if you look at our um, communities and things like Facebook and Twitter, your friends are probably people who think a lot like you. And then surprisingly, they post information that's gonna be consistent with your beliefs and then you eat it up. And in fact, when people don't uh, believe consistently with you, we delete them, right? Like, oh, I can't believe that person said that I'm gonna delete them. So I feel like it's, particularly with social media, this echo chamber of we're just surrounding ourselves more and more with confirmation bias and um, what we read, who we interact with, where we get information. And it's super easy to forget the information or discount it that's not consistent with our already formed beliefs, like plastic bags. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this in one second because I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the politics and the politicization. politicization. Um, but first, one of the questions that just popped up in the chat, I think we didn't really touch on earlier, and it's worth mentioning, and that is the, the role of money um, in the mistrust of medical science. And I wonder if any of you would like to comment on uh, whether that you think is playing a, a major role, a modest role, a small role, no role at all, in the extent to which people mistrust um, at least certain aspects of medical science. I, I certainly know in the vaccination, in the anti-vaccination sort of hesitancy movement, 
this is a big thread that uh, you know you can't trust the pharmaceutical companies and you can't trust anyone who works with them, including all the scientists uh, or the CDC, that they all have a financial interest in this, in this endeavor. And I, I wonder if that's a, playing a role as well in some of the anti-mask uh, movement. Are you seeing that elsewhere? So I, um, I'm not really seeing it in the anti-mask movement as much, not as, at least not from my perspective, although you might have other um, thoughts around that. But I do think that uh, there is a very clear um, uh, idea that people hold that money has a lot to do um, with our scientific recommendations, right? I mean, again, I'm going back to my schoolhouse rock days, which I try not to take everything from the third grade forward, but I'm working through this in therapy, I think is really what, uh, what you guys are learning about me here. Um, everything but, you needed to know you learned in kindergarten. <laughs> right. But it's like even the food pyramid, right? That again, we learn as a young people that that's what we're supposed to eat and why, and it's good for you. It was because of money to an industry, right? It's because we wanted to put, provide more money to ranchers, farmers, and all of that. It's like, that is, that's real, right? Um, and there is money in these recommendations, especially as they intersect with policy um, and politics. Um, also this year, I ran a bill to expand access to PrEP and PEP, you know, um, which are, you know, HIV medications that, Honestly, we could have had a long time ago, but because of the bias around um, who was contracting HIV and AIDS, there was less research put into that area, you know, um, and took much longer for folks to even acknowledge um, that it was something that wasn't just killing, you know, gay people because they were evil, right? Um, and now here we are today still breaking down some of those biases within policymaking, but also um, there is that layer of what we were investing in before and then what we're investing in now. So now you have the left, and I'm sorry to make this a left-right thing, and I'll, I'll try not to, but you do have folks kind of on the far left who are saying, you know, don't take any of these drugs because the pharmaceuticals are really just trying to profit off of you. So we wanted the drugs, but no one would fund them. We have the drugs, we don't trust them, you know? And it is, money is a big part of that because, um, we see the threads, right? And then it's hard to say, okay, now this is good for you, even though we know money still has an impact. Um, that being said, I don't see a lot of ways that we could not have money influence this process. You know, a lot of times money sets the priorities, which that is something I think we can really work on and shift. Um, but you will not have um, research scientists at CU without some money, you know? Um, and so, it is a balance, but it is extremely real. Um, and it's not just an American phenomenon, it's definitely global, right? Yeah. Hey, Norman, let, uh, let me jump in here real quick, because I think we're seeing it today in, the, uh, in, in COVID as well. You see this balance between opening up and the economy and public health and the economy. Mm -hmm. That's really about money. All these businesses going out of business. And I saw a study here in the last day or so that suggests that because kids aren't going to school, it estimated how much less lifetime earnings they'll have because they missed these last six months of school. It's somewhere between $6,000 and $100,000 over their lifetime because they're less well-educated than they would have been otherwise. So I, I think in many cases, it does come back to money, maybe not big money, but, but money and resources to each of us individually. Yeah, and the irony there, of course, is that had we really done the job that many other countries around the world did in managing the pandemic early on, we might have an economy that is much more recovered right now than we have been able to achieve. Yeah, so and we a, definitely heard that. And that's really, George, that's a, such a good point. We definitely heard that a lot in politics and we still do. Like, is Governor Polish trying to save lives or save businesses, right? Like it's this juxtaposition, which you know, we can talk about that forever because it's really not. Um, but that is what people are hearing. And it seems like such a clear uh, enemy and a clear target is money in science, money in politics, money in, seems like that, that clear common enemy when really it's so much more complicated than that. Yeah, um, we've been, we, we talked a little bit earlier today, George, about the vaccine, um, the sort of huge push 
to produce a vaccine in a very short period of time and the amount of resources, uh, including cash, going into this, not just in the US, but in China. And we compared it uh, to the Manhattan Project, except it's much bigger because there's a Manhattan Project happening in China right now. And there's a Manhattan Project happening in Germany and throughout the EU. There's a Manhattan Project happening in the US, five of them, really, because there's five, five major vaccine candidates that are, that are moving forward and something like 30 something, 30 or so uh, candidates altogether. Um, is that playing into the data that we've seen recently about mistrust of a potential vaccine? I don't know if others heard the, the NPR story the other day, but more than 50% of people now say they would not take a vaccine if it came out tomorrow for COVID. And that's obviously a lot higher number than people who normally say, I wouldn't take a vaccine, right? The, normally, the vast majority of people actually do agree that vaccines are safe and effective and worth it. Um, but for this particular vaccine, the number of people who've expressed uh, cynicism about it is quite high. There's and I, also I wonder a, what's playing into that. Let's go ahead, Stephanie, some, sorry. Uh, studies out in this week's Bloomberg um, about that economic disparity and persons from lower incomes have, are even less likely to want to take the vaccine and people in rural areas feel the same. Uh, and I guess it's, it doesn't feel terribly surprising to me when some of these same people have been asked to go into work and so we've communicated very clearly how much we value their health by saying, nope, you're an essential worker, you've got to go in to the office. And now we're going to offer a vaccine. And if the, the Bloomberg study, at least was like, and if we made it free, then I think it, if you make it free, it's like, you're almost saying like, if we want to try, we want you guys to try it. If you charged a ton for it, I think that you'd have the opposite response of like, only the wealthy can get the um, vaccine. But I think when you're consistently given the message of like, you're, we don't value you as much. You don't have access to the same health care. You don't have um, the same access to education for your kids in this, you know, amidst COVID that it's really, to me, it's no doubt. Like, of course you wouldn't feel safe, right? Yeah. I've sometimes wondered though, um, it's easier in, uh, it's easier to say I would not take a vaccine in a survey than it might be in real life after you've watched all the Denver Broncos line up to get the vaccine and you've watched all of the nuggets get the vaccine and you're wondering when is the, <laughs> and all the doctors and nurses are going to get the vaccine early on mm -hmm. and and by the time it gets to the general public I, I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of the data that say everyone's going to turn it down I think by the time it gets to the general public it's conceivable that people will say how come it took so long to get to us I oh, so guarantee whatever you do, it will have, there will be that backlash, you know, yes, um, that's right. ab absolutely that will happen. And, um, and, and I think that we just have to keep pushing with what we know is right, at least at the time. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, I would be happy to see those folks get the vaccines first and obviously not have those adverse, um, effects. Right. And then to move it into the community. But I got to tell you, there are people in my community who are like, no way we're going to be first. We've been there, done that, you know, um, and, you know, and then the erasure of our history just makes it even worse, right? Because people aren't even learning about the Tuskegee studies and all of that in school anymore. And then they hear about it later on and it's like, whoa, they're trying to go back to studying us, you know, and, and doing all these, this testing on us. It's not okay. Um, so as an elected official, though, and as a leader in the community, which some folks see the Broncos too as leaders, you know, when it's time, we do need to go get those vaccines um, and show folks in our communities that we are healthy and safe, and then just know that it will take a it will take a certain amount of time before we are vaccinated to a level where we can feel like we can go back to business as usual, if that's even going to be a thing. George, do you want to weigh in on this before I go back to the politicization issue that I wanted to ask uh, Representative Herod about? Yeah, I, I think this is going to be the next big controversy like masks. And, and we're going to have to figure this out. If we, if we go through all of this, spend all this money to create vaccines, and then we can't convince people to take it, shame on us. 
uh, that's that's just uh, that's just poor leadership up and down the line all around the world. So um, my uh, best wishes to Representative Herod and to Governor Polis because I think this is going to be a big one, and, and hopefully Colorado Colorado's done really well in leading this state through this, and I'm hoping you that we can be an example for vaccines as well. Um, Representative Herod, I want to turn back to the politicization. I'm going to never say that politicization, politicization of um, of science, um, and I, I'm thinking about a recent Pew uh, research study. So uh, they asked people, "Do you trust doctors? Do you trust scientists?" And they've done this study year after year after year for many years, and um, and in fact, from 2019 to 2020, trust in scientists and trust in doctors went up. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the few months after the pandemic began, these numbers were actually rising, but only among Democrats. <laughs> Republicans have stayed the same uh, at the, the same level of trust, which is, by the way, not a terrible level of trust, but it's not as high as, as uh, Democrats. And at risk of, um, of being, uh, you know, diving into partisan issues, is there something about um, progressive politics, which is more accepting of the ideals of science, the idea that things change and evolve and improve, and a conservative mindset, which might be conservative, right? Like preserving the status quo and not being too enthusiastic about changing things, and maybe even going back to a prior status quo that you liked better than the one today, right? So that, is there something about that mindset difference or are we really just talking about the political, you know, personalities that happen to be in office right now? And in fact, um, conservatives, Republicans um, can be just as enthusiastic about scientific advances as Democrats. It's, it's really sort of a personality thing that we're seeing right now. Oh, I could say so many things that would get you all in so much trouble um, that I won't. And I mean, you know, I don't want any new Twitter trolls, but um, let's see how I should put this. It is a leadership issue. Um, it is a 100% a leadership issue. The, the White House has determined to muddle science in a way that was completely and is completely unnecessary, harmful, um, and deadly, period. Um, it is not a partisan issue. It is a leadership issue. So you have uh, conservative countries taking this much more seriously, right? Putting in place policies that keep their communities safe and ensure a quick and swift recovery. And you don't see the politicization happening as much because it's real, right? COVID is real. And um, they have leaders who are saying COVID is real and it's deadly and it's not just the flu um, over again. And so I 100% think it's a leadership issue. You know. Um, in, in quarantine, we all watched way too many of the press conferences. Like I had to watch all of them and you could just see the difference and just the mistrust that has almost feels intentionally sowed within our, within our country. Um, and I think it's, it's negligent and it's dangerous. So I hope I was at least a little bit nonpartisan on that because I honestly, I don't think it's about conservative and liberal, and I don't think it's about Democratic and, and Republican. I do think it is about leadership um, and the lack of leadership when it comes to uh, COVID and science. Um, Stephanie, I wonder if um, you want to comment on this because we had a little bit of an earlier conversation, and you know the numbers on this were quite good in terms of good if if you believe that trust is warranted. Most people in fact do trust the scientists and trust the research enterprise by and large, setting aside the, the specifics of a vaccine that many people apparently think is being rushed in its production. Um, but, but most people do actually trust science and scientists. So are we making too much of this um, and are we responding essentially to a, a vocal minority, you know, but a, a pretty small minority who are sort of dedicated anti-science um, uh, folks, or is this a real concern? I mean, to we me, probably should have started with that question. To me, it's a real concern because 
I mean, there's still people in in the U.S. who think this is all just a conspiracy, that there is no COVID. And they're throwing COVID parties and taking bets on who's going to, like, if someone here has it, how many people are going to get sick? And there's, you know, lots of people who won't wear masks, like consider even in Colorado, which, you know, we're doing a good job, I think. Um, I see on the morning news fights in shopping in stores because someone's walking in without a mask and another person's telling them you have to wear a mask and they're like, it's a free country. Um, and it's also the store. So you have to do what the store says. So I, I feel like it's a huge issue in talking about the vaccine is like a good vaccine is 70% effective, right? And maybe 90% is what we're shooting for. But that means that that's when everyone takes it, right? And if there's only 57 or 50 percent of people taking it, then you're still going to get a ton of community spread because the vaccine will not be 100 percent perfect. So I feel like this is maybe I don't want to be like a, you know negative, but I feel like this is a huge issue that we need to be going into communities and like helping educate people on how important this is. Someone wrote in the chat that Boulder is where I live is among the least vaccinated um, counties in the country. And, and so I don't believe it is totally just like a conservative um, liberal issue, but it is a, a real public health issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Representative Harris, do you want to comment on that? And then I'm going to yeah. close with a question for George. Yeah, I, I just, Stephanie, right, I, geez, all the stuff that you brought up completely, you know, nail on head, right? But so the other thing that I forgot to mention that Stephanie brought up for me is that, you know, being at the Capitol, right, and watching this every single day unfold, there was this um, very odd and interesting convergence of the anti-vaxxers and the open government people. Mm -hmm. um, and that really expanded. And the anti-vaxxers that Stephanie mentioned were not all Republicans, right? Um, they were not all conservative and it just became this like this this group now this coalition of folks who are really just anti and can almost to the conspiracy theorist side and so I think we have um, seen that increase a lot. The other thing that I wonder and I'm just going to throw this out there because I don't know the answer to it but um, Stephanie you said something and it triggered in me because you said the vaccine is not going to be perfect. Well, oh no, there you go. There's someone saying that it's not going to work. You know what I mean? But it's like this um, American exceptionalism too. Like, okay, if it's not going to work, if it's going to work 99% of the time, not that one. So then I could just be the one who doesn't get, who doesn't get the vaccine and I'm fine. You know what I mean? Like, or I can be the one that, you know, it's just like this, like this exceptionalism that we have. That means we don't actually, we, we are so, uh, perfect in some ways we are not even going to be affected by this this fake virus going around right like this this thing that's happening and i wonder if there's something in our core values that we are going to have to address with messaging too um because seriously it popped in my head like oh no i'm gonna have to hear about this one you know what i mean like because it won't be perfect right it's not gonna be but that really does sit with us very differently yeah, I'm sorry for saying that now. <laughs> well, the, it's the truth. But, uh, it should be untruthful, you know? No, and someone yeah. posted in the chat, like, I would rather, I would have more trust in scientists who admit this isn't going to be 100% right. effective right. to um, warding off illness. And, you know, there may be some side effects, just like there are with any vaccine or medication that you take. But I think if we could focus yeah. on the collective good, so like your, the risk that it's not effective for you and the risk that something could happen to you, those are such smaller risks than the massive risk of people getting COVID and the impact, like if you want to take it on from an economic issue, the impact it's having on the economy, um, those risks to me, I guess I will be first in line to take it. You know, the um, the likely thing is the vaccine might be about 50% effective. That's that's what is required in order for it to be approved, um, is a 50% reduction in the likelihood of contracting the illness if you're exposed. Which, by the way, is not nothing, right? A 50% reduction is you're half as likely to catch it if you get exposed to it. So it's worth approving that vaccine probably. Um, but but those are the numbers we're very likely to see is something around 50% effectiveness, which is about what the flu vaccine typically runs. 
it's about 50% effective. Um, George, do you, uh, do you wanna help us wrap up by, um, by telling us if there are things that people in the audience tonight should be doing? And I'm gonna assume that we've got people in the audience who are um, what, you, what you would call sort of informed lay people, but we also have, I know, some people in the audience who are clinicians, um, who are in the healthcare system, who are medical scientists. Um, so I guess I'd like to speak to both of them and say, you know, we, what are the things that the medical scientists and clinicians should be doing to ensure the trustworthiness of the, of the science research enterprise? And on the, on the sort of patient side, if you will, what is it that the public should do to ensure that they are skeptical when they should be skeptical and seeking out information when they should be seeking out information, but not being so skeptical as to be in science denial um, or to not be able to trust when there really is strong consensus around what is the, the right thing to do and why. So if, if the basis of all of this uh, could be solved by a higher level of trust, I think each one of us plays part in that. My wife is a surgeon and I asked her this morning, how much training did you have on how to develop trust of your patients in you and in your practice? And she said, zero. She didn't receive a single minute of training in her 20 some years of medical practice and, and school on how to do that. So I think the people in the industry um, should listen more, listen with empathy. Uh, uh, almost all of us are at least semi-rational human beings. We all have self-interest and values, which are at times uh, in conflict with things. But if, if uh, you can, if you're in the medical field, if you can listen to your patients with a little more empathy, uh, I think that would help. On the other side, I think this appropriate skepticism is real. Look for good sources of information. Uh, you and I had a discussion today about whether Twitter is a good source of information. A well-curated Twitter feed is a fabulous source of information. If you get experts, you get great organizations, and you follow them, uh, it's, a, it's the best there is. Most of my climate knowledge comes from Twitter through the scientists who publish papers and they, they'll publish a paper and they will be on Twitter that afternoon. And, uh, but if you just willy nilly go uh, accept anybody and don't curate your feed, then, then, you're, then you have a problem. And then the final thing I would say is I'd come back to what uh, Stephanie said about the collective good. And somebody in the chat said there is no collective good, but I believe every single one of us play a part in that. And uh, if today we can accept each other Gosh, you don't want to wear a mask. I, I understand that. Uh, uh, tell me why not, et cetera. I choose to wear one. Create more dialogue, more listening. Each of us, I think, are trying the best we can just to get by and make it through this. This is the time when we need to exhibit a little more grace to each other all across the board. If we do that, we can take down the level of rhetoric, create a little more trust across the board, and we'll get through this just fine. Um, and, and I believe everyone on this call can do a little bit to make that better. Well, thank you all, uh, all three for joining us tonight and for this really terrific conversation. Um, and again, Rep. Herod, thanks especially for taking time out from the convention to be with us. Um, we appreciate you traveling back from Mini Milwaukee. Uh. Thanks for having me. And Clinton says, hello. <laughs> <laughs> My, the newest, my puppy now. <laughs> the newest Clinton. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. And I, I wish everyone a happy evening and, and join us again next time. Bye. Bye-bye.